So welcome to the third and final um, session in the series on You Can Heal Your Life. And the first session, as you will remember, was on um, Heal the Secret Corners of Yourself. And we spent some time bringing uh, loving kindness, um, a warm, tender heart, and our psychological resources to places in ourselves that need healing. And that was that's the essence of bringing psychological healing to ourselves. The second session was on the different types of psychological, spiritual, biosphere, ancestral, um, did I say spiritual, spiritual resources that we can bring to bear in the process of healing. And this session is about um, what's the purpose of healing? Why are we healing in the first place? What's this all about? The title is The Journey of Healing, Transformation, and fulfillment. So, of course, the purpose of healing is, you know, obviously the first is to stop us feeling pain. Um, but the, the the larger purpose of healing is to um, release ourselves so that we can fulfill um, our potential in life. And I was thinking about what are the different ways of talking about our potential in life. And the first is about being, which is just really simply so that we can enjoy our lives. There's a potential to enjoy the beauty of existence, the beauty of being alive, um, the beauty of the moment, the beauty of this great magnificence. And uh, sort of coming out of that, uh, if we're really present with the beauty of existence in the present moment, comes a feeling of love. Love naturally arises. It's really the, the second thing that arises. The first thing that arises um, in being is um, just being really noticing the beauty of the present moment, the magnificence of it. But the second thing that arises is love for it and also love for the suffering that we have as human beings, love, compassion for other people, compassion for oneself. So as one experiences the beauty of existence, um, one author calls it the terrible beauty of existence. And um, once we experience that, then this compassion arises as well. So those are sort of two primary parts of purpose of life as being. And being itself is, it's, it's a profound portal into the most deepest mystical states. Being is where nirvana um, happens. You know, samsara is the pain of our lives. And nirvana is when we've overcome, you know, sort of, the realm where everything is happy and wonderful and great. But actually, um, the, the goal is to go beyond samsara and nirvana. It's not that we abandon one. And um, we, it's not that we abandon um, the world of suffering because there are people around us suffering. If we don't notice the suffering, we're not very human, are we? It's that we, that in our own practice for ourselves, we've gone to this deep place where we're no longer making judgments about our experience. The, the experience in the moment is a sort of blissful, mystical realization of awareness itself, of Buddha nature itself, of Holy Spirit itself, if you want to use that language, and which is beyond um, suffering or pleasure. And of course, you know, I'm a long way from that, so I'm just talking about theory, but this idea that we can get to this place, which is um, really um, deep and really um, blissful, that is beyond the suffering of the world. I think it's a beautiful just to have it as an idea and that we're, that's what we're on the journey towards. And so then, you know, as a part of that, we ha also have um, just, you know, at a, a more simple level, we have um, the idea that let me be here and live my creative self in an authentic way. Um, let me be my authentic self and let me express myself in an authentic way. Just in this moment, let me be, um, let me have the wisdom of an adult, but the innocence of a child. Let me be, play in the great scheme of life, but with some of the, protection that uh, being an adult provides us with. I often think of it as being like, um, you know, if you let your kids go into the playground and there are these very high 
climbing apparatus and slides and you just watch your kid depending on the age of your kid to make sure they're not going to fall off anything or that some stranger doesn't come along and you know try and take them away so the parent is watching um you know is watchful but to the greatest extent possible lets the child play in this innocent way and then we're free to be the innocent child so that the ideal is that we have a sort of guardian who's our wise adult mind but the as much as we can, we're just being our playful selves, uh, you know, our innocent selves. When you look in the eyes of a baby, if you talk to a small child, that innocence is really something to return to. And uh, that's what I find to be true about the great saints and, the, um, and masters that I've met. They have this sort of simplicity, this innocence. And so that's the journey of being. And I said quite a lot about it because... I want us to know that it's more than just mindfulness. You know, mindfulness is great for, you know, relaxing you, de-stressing you. It helps your performance at work, it does lots of things. But actually, mindfulness is a portal into something much, much deeper. Um, and I want to keep reminding us of that because the secularization of mindfulness is great in a way. But it, it, but it doesn't remind us, it doesn't tell us, the, the invitation to be mindful doesn't say that actually this is a path to mystical union with the one, um, which is the most profound of all the paths. So that's the you know, purpose in life as being, just really enjoying existence. There's also um, a purpose in life um, of becoming, becoming more of who we truly are, and beyond that, there's, there's some purpose in life in doing. Although, um, you know, uh, doing is a treacherous ally because we set goals in life, and some of which we achieve and some of which we can't achieve. And in fact, some of the trouble, the suffering of life comes from setting goals that we are unable to achieve. You know, it can be very, very basic ones like, you know, I want to have children, you know, but I haven't for whatever reason, or... I want to be uh, successful in a particular career, but actually I'm not quite cut out for it. Or I want to be in a particular relationship, but that person doesn't want me as much as I want them. Or, or whatever it is. So the doing um, is a place where we, there's great achievement is possible. And in fact, the path of doing can be, you know, is a way of discovering one's true self, but there's all, there can be a lot of suffering in it. Um, in climbing um, Everest and the 14 highest peaks in the world, Reinhold Mesner quoted the Indian philosopher Tagore and said, the goal is not to reach the utmost limits. The goal is not to reach the utmost limits, but to find the place that has no boundaries. So even something as physical, practical, goal oriented as climbing Himalayan peaks the purpose is not really to climb the peak, but to find a place that has no boundaries. And by the way, on that journey, I can't remember which, which mountain it was, but his brother died on the descent with him on one of those, from one of those mountains. That's an example of the suffering of life, even if one's pursuing some great, you know, great endeavor. And so um, sort of one step, so if being is the most present, and doing is the most active and engaged and planning between the two is becoming. Becoming more of who I truly am, becoming more of um, the sort of person that I truly want to be. And it can be someone being someone who does. That's, you know, that's a part of it. But I always love the... Um, the thing that the couples counselor will do or the psychotherapist says to somebody who, who's there talking about their marriage and whether their marriage will survive or not. And the, the couples counselor says, I don't know whether your marriage will, to the individual, so it's a one-to-one -one session. I don't know whether your marriage will survive or not. But I do know that you can, you can be the sort of person that you truly want to be and live in the way that you truly want to live. There's a place beyond the successes and failures of life where we handle the successes well, hopefully humbly, and we also handle the failures well um, with some resilience, picking ourselves up quickly, um, keep, you know, keeping our eyes on the stars, 
even as we fall in the gutter. And so that's the journey of, of becoming. And the crucial part of the journey of becoming is you know, what I call life calling, because there's so much evidence that supports the idea that if you have a, a sense of purpose, that um, that sense of purpose, you'll be more, you're more, if you have a sense of purpose, you'll be more su successful, um, you will um, communicate better, um, you will be more resilient to difficulty, you will have better health outcomes, you will have um, greater longevity. There's all this research from the positive psychology movement that demonstrates that. And so um, life calling or the journey of becoming, life calling is the most important thing in your life, but it's not a job description. So it's not, I want to be a pop star, you know, but, you know, some, you know, or I want to be a ballet dancer on the stage of the Royal Opera House, which you may or succeed or fail at. But I want to um, express voices into the world that haven't been heard uh, before or, or express marginalized voices out into the world. Or well, my life calling is helping people blossom. So it's not a job description. It's something beyond a job description but it also applies equally to your relationship with yourself and your relationship with your loved ones, your friends, and your community. As you know, my life calling is helping people blossom, starting with myself. And um, I came from a very toxic family. And if I hadn't uh, found that life calling at an early age or started walking the path of that life calling at an early age, I would have you know, probably become alcoholic, divorced, possibly, you know, depressed and possibly suicidal. Uh, and I've talk, told you, many of you have heard my story before, I won't go into it again now. So that life calling is a sense of purpose. It's the unique difference that you make in the world, both for yourself, what's most important to you, what's most important in terms of the gift that you can give to the world, and also, it's what you're most interested in exploring in your relationships and your friendship circles and your community. You want to find people who are interested in that about you. And one of the wonderful things about life calling is if you take, the, take your life calling and you combine it with your strengths, because your, the life callings, they can sound quite similar sometimes. They're quite at a high level. But once you combine it with strengths and with your life history, your personal experience, it, be, um, it becomes unique. The combination of your life calling, your, your talents and strengths, and your personal history means that you're the only one in the world who has this unique combination. The great thing about that is you can therefore be the master of your own discipline, your own version, your own recipe. You are the expert in your own recipe. And the poetic way that I think about it is that, that there's a, a, a gap in the world that's waiting for you to fulfill that gap. There's a space in the world. The world wants creativity. It wants expression. Otherwise, why would we have so many different colored flowers? Why would we have so many insects? Why would we have so many amazing species? Um, the, the world is full of creativity that's a, that's we can see in every moment and we are a part of that creativity so what color flower are you what type of flower are you and how do you release your difficulty your woundedness efficiently and also uh, lean into your life calling your strengths your vision your psychological resources so that you can express your own nature your own true nature as clearly as you can out into the world and so for me it's you know I, there's a thing in in um, Gregory Bateson talks about but it is very obvious when we you look at the martial art Aikido which is that um that first you learn technique you learn how to defend yourself but you know you know we're not living you know most of us are not living in a place where we need to you know to defend ourselves physically very much um and so after a few years, you, you become more interested in how do I improve? How do I learn how to learn? How do I optimize, maximize my ability to learn from life? 
And then the third level is, well, after about 10 years, you start saying, well, you know, why am I learning at all? What's the purpose of this? And so, um, the, you know, in doing in the world, in making stuff happen in the world, we're on this, what I call it, a path of mastery, which is the, 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 prof, the profession that we're engaging in or the activity that we're engaging in. It could be relationships, for example. That's a path of mastery. That, that I'm doing it, but I'm learning about myself. I'm learning about relationships. I'm learning about life. And then ultimately I'm learning about the meaning of existence, something beyond that. Um, and so that, you know, in climbing the mountain, Reinhold Mesner had to first learn to climb mountains, learn to use technical equipment, um, learn to um, survive at high altitude. Um, and then secondly, he was like, um, you know, as a young man was particularly working on developing his competence and skills. Um, one of the things he did in the Alps when he was a school teacher working in the Alps as a young man was every weekend he would go and free climb easy alpine climbs. That's without a rope. And But as the weeks went by, they'd get harder and harder. And in the end, he was free climbing the hardest routes in the Alps, which would take you know, such as the north face of the Eiger that so many people have died on. And there'd be some poor um, team sitting cold in the snow on the north face of the Eiger, waiting for the weather to pass. And he would come sauntering up in half a day past them. So the second level is, you know, the explore, exploring your competence and giving your gift to the world. But then ultimately, it's about understanding the nature of life itself. Uh, um, the goal is not to reach the utmost limits, but to find the place that has no boundaries. And so it takes you back to being again. But for most of us in just a practical, you know, everyday way, you know, we're not, not all of us are mystics. All of us are mystics, but we won't realize that probably, um, or we won't become interested in that until, many people will not become interested in that until shortly before you die. You know, I think spirituality gets forced on us. I think, um, but at a more practical level, um, that that knowing who we are and expressing who we are and knowing what we're about, knowing our life calling, making the most of our talents and our abilities, is great for our personal relationships. It's great for making peace with ourselves, and it's great for beginning to move our careers so that um, they're more, we're more focused on what brings us bliss, what brings us joy, our, what makes our heart sing, our true passion, than we are on the, some mundane job, job. Many people are lucky. They've chosen a career that is somewhere close to their life calling. If, they're lucky, if you're lucky, that's the case. And some people actually have to say, oh, I became, became a finance person. It was a good job from university. I did it, but I'm now 40. Um, I really have had enough of this. I want to find a way into a new career. The other thing to just mention is that one of the best times to find your life calling, I just want to tell you this, is um, when you're coming up to retirement or when you've retired. Because if you're lucky enough to have done a job which has given you a pension, you know, some of you have and some of you haven't, you know, then you've got complete freedom at retirement to do whatever it, uh, whatever it is you want without worrying about how much you get paid for it. So you can do a very, very pure expression of it. And of course, in terms of longevity, there are some people who want to go home and dig the roses. But unless you love roses, it's not going to be very good for your psychological and physical health. Um, and so I think the modern idea is that we find what you love and do it until you drop. That's what I propose. And of course, you can do it as a volunteer or you can do it on a part time basis or you can do it low paid income. Um, I've always thought I loved volunteering at the hospital, talking to people who were dying and for whom there was no hope of um, physical recovery. Uh, it really touched my um, soul. And I always know that at any point in my life, I haven't got anything to do. I can go back and do that. It's a beautiful thing to do. It makes me feel alive. And so I think there's a great sort of um, 
feeling of safety for me, of satisfaction for me, in knowing that I'll always have a way to give my gift to the world. And so that's that's the journey of becoming. And the poet um, David White talks about the three marriages, the marriage with yourself, the marriage of making peace with yourself and loving all the corners of yourself, the marriage of you know, love, of family, of relationship. And by the way, folks, I spent much of my life single and it really is great to know, you know, I was talking to somebody about this yesterday, that it's quite okay. It's a really good proposition to say, I'm not very good in one-to-one -one relationships, but I'm really good at friendship. I've got a lot of attention into friendships. The great thing about friendships is you haven't got all your eggs in one basket. There's a sort of modern obsession with romance, which is, you know, it's great. You have all these movies, you know, uh, boy meets girl, disaster happens, they hate each other, then they go on an adventure, and then towards the end of the movie, they make up with each other, and then they live happily ever after. Well, of course, when they get married, married is when the trouble starts, isn't it? You know, the whole movie happens before the interesting part. So, you know, if you have got the attachment, if, if the attachment that you learned as a child from your parents was really healthy, you may be quite good at one-to-one -one relationships. But if the attachment was toxic or interrupted, um, um, then you may not be so good at one-to-one -one relationships. And that is that can be fixed and it, and it takes and it's hard to fix, just so you know. And if you're someone who's better at friendship, you can get most of your needs, your emotional needs can get met through friendship. I really recommend it. And then, of course, it's great to have both, isn't it? To have, um, you know, a partner, but also to invest a lot in the sort of emotional, psychological intimacy with people that you know. So that's the marriage of love, friendship, community. And then, of course, the marriage with your work, which is about learning to give your gift to the world. And um, so that's sort of, you know, that's why we do the healing. So the he, so, you know, on the one hand, know your life calling, know your strengths, um, develop your, your psychological resources, the resources that you have from your ancestors, and also there may need to be heals, wounds to be healed, the resources available to you through your culture and through the community of mind, the resources available to you through the biosphere, Mother Earth, nature, because we, we have never been, when, we're not separate from nature. We've never been separate from nature. With every breath, we demonstrate our place in the biosphere. It's a psychological and emotional resource that actually, there's lots of evidence to support it. To support, you know, doctors should send people, are now sending people into nature uh, when they've got mild depression. You know, it supports the immune system. There's tons of stuff that science is catching up with which is sort of intuitive in a way, but we, we already know. And then, um, you know, nature, and then also spiritual connection, connection with life that is bigger than ourselves, with the field, you know, so the field that's bigger than ourselves is the community that we're in, it's the culture that we're in, it's the biosphere that we're in you know, the whole of planet Earth, but also it's the universe that we're in. Um, and then, to, you know, to wonder, you know, what, you know, what is this all about? Uh, you know, what connections do I have to a narrative that supports me feeling myself as part of the one rather than as a separate self? You know, it's, it's sort of, if I feel part of the one, then when my body dies, it's not going to be too much. I'm not going to be too upset about it. But if I just think I'm a separate self, it may be very scary to die. 
you know, the, um, the metaphor I like is the one of the ocean, where um, if you identify as the wave, then you froth for, you, you rise, you froth for a while, you disappear. If you identify with the ocean, then you're always around. And intellectually, you know, this is, this is something to experience somatically through essentially um, prayer and mindfulness practice and any of those access to those sorts of resources that you already have are, are worth pursuing because it does make a, a, a tremendous difference. Talking about it isn't really helpful. I think it was Wittgenstein. I can't quite remember the story, but he was, um, you know, he was at, I think he was at Cambridge with Bertrand Russell. He was his great, you know, professor. And, um, and then he wrote the words, you know, of, of uh, whereof um, I do not know, I cannot speak. I think that's the end of his tractus. I think that's right. And then he goes off and he leaves the university and he goes off and becomes a school teacher somewhere in Germany or Austria. You know, there are things that are beyond cognitive knowledge, intellectualization in life. Gregory Bateson says, man's reach goes beyond his grasp. Else what's a metaphor? There's more to life than our cognitive minds can get. And if we only get the map at the cognitive level. Did you know that the, the, the neuroscience now says that it's the right brain that experiences life and it's the left brain that makes maps of it. But our education system mainly trains the left brain, the intellect. And so all we're doing is playing with maps of reality rather than leaning into the experience direct experience of it and there's much there's much beyond the maps you know thank god life isn't just a map so and so you know what you know the purpose of life or one you know you you can invent it you it's possible to say that when i'm being and so i'm in the present moment and i'm not thinking about the past or my childhood or what happened yesterday or my business and I'm not thinking about where I want to go in the future and I'm just in the present but there's no purpose at all you know there's no goal orientation at all in that childlike innocence in the present moment um, and, yet, and yet there is the arising of this um, sort of lucidness um, clarity and feeling of of just happiness bliss is a very big word but just joy being alive and love so that in, even though that's not a purpose you could we could call it that but there is a feeling of love of the beauty and also love of people because people and all beings because they suffer we help an animal in distress don't we and so that's sort of the first level of the most sort of fundamental level of life, but also becoming the idea that, you know, one of the questions, you know, I ask people around their life vision, you know, how will you know you've had a good life? What will it look like, sound like, feel like? What will you look like, sound like, feel like when you fulfilled your potential in life? Have a big dream about what it is to fulfill your potential in life. Have a big dream about the relationship you'll have with yourself. You know, how will you feel? How will you be at peace with yourself? Have a big dream about your relationship with other people, whether it's an intimate relationship with one person or deep friendship intimacy with many friends. And have a dream about you know, the giving your, how you've given your gift to the world. What you, what's the gift that you want to give that you would give whether or not you were paid for it, that you still want to give? Have that dream of how you will know you had a great life. How will you know that you've had a successful life? And then 
for me, you know, sort of my theory is that if that's the case, you'll die easily and you'll die in a timely way. And so then, then you say, well, that's where I want to be when I'm, and uh, again, you know, pick a good, a really good age, you know. So a good age being, um, you know, there's a, there's a Jewish thing that, that people say at funerals, which is, you know, have a long life. They bless the children at the funeral and so have a long life. And my friend Malcolm says, I don't want a long life. I want a long, healthy life. You know, I only want my life to be as long as it's healthy. Um, but, you know, imagine that you're, that you eat well, you take exercise, you do psychological resourcing and all of those things, and that you, that you live, you can live, you know, 20, 30 years longer than your parents. You know, that's, longevity has changed. My parents, they didn't eat vegetables. They were alcoholic. They didn't take exercise. And they were pretty healthy till they're 90. So that gives me, you know, maybe to 100, you know, hopefully, possibly 110. You know, it's sort of... Um, so have a vision of being healthy and, and then do, do something about it. The, the, the thing with visions and goals is that it's not enough just to have the vision. You also need to have to imagine the how. I can't just say I'll be healthy, healthy at 110. I have to say I'll be healthy at 110 because I'm upping my daily exercise. I'm doing strength training. I'm stretching. I'm, I'm paying more attention to my diet. Um, there's lots of stuff that we can take care of now. But have a vision of that. And, um, and then you start to work towards it. And, you know, part of that process, I think it's helpful for me. So, that, so this is my vision of my healthy old age. So this is where I want to be by the time I'm 85. You know, I want to go part time when I'm 85. If my, you know, God willing, if my brain lasts and my body lasts, I'll want to keep doing what I'm doing until I'm 85. And then I might go part time. We'll see. You know, just have a vision of it, an inspirational vision. So that's where I want to be where I'm 85. Where do I want to be when I'm 70? You know, and then, you, you know, you're younger than me. Where do I want to be when I'm 50 or 60, 40, the big decades? And then you start working back. And then you say, well, you know, so I'm 66 now. I'll be 70 in um, 2025. God, it's getting, coming up fast, isn't it? So where do I want to be next year? Where do I want to be the year after? And if that's where I want to be next year and the year after, where do I want to be at the end of this year? And then what do I need? What do I want to do this year that will help me get to my healthy old age? So if you start cascading back, then you say, actually, it's really important for me to contact the gym this week and get back in onto the, the cross trainer or whatever it happens to be. Um, and so we sort of have a discipline, but it's a discipline that supports our joy. Uh, uh, it's because we're excited about the potential of our lives. I don't know what my potential will be. You won't know what your potential is until the day before you die, you know, or the day you die, you know. But let's, you know, go for gold, see where you get to. Um, and that, for me, is an exciting way to live life. Because otherwise, if I'm just dealing with how much money do I earn, you know, the problems of today, fighting with my girlfriend, you know, dealing with COVID, there's so much paying taxes, there's so much mundane nonsense, isn't there? You know, if, if, if that's where my focus is, life's not that great, you know, I mean, it's like, what for? But if I've got a vision, I'm, if I'm doing these things because I'm making something happen, making something interesting happen, then it's all worth doing. So that's, that's why I think that having a, you know, a vision of your life is such an important thing. And then, you know, the path of mastery, the life calling, what we do in all the spheres of our life is all a part of that. In a, and again, there's a danger. Some, some people are very driven and then they're always trying, you know, got to do more, got to do more, got to do more, got to do more. That's why the being balance is, is important. Sometimes I've got to do more. Sometimes I want to be more. And probably on a daily, weekly, monthly, annual basis, you need time for that. Time for annually, you know, daily time to meditate or to walk in the forest or to sit quietly or, um, 
listen to music, time, you know, in the week, perhaps at the weekend to get into nature or have a long intimate conversation with friends, you know, in a way that's timeless or dance. And, you know, annually spend, even if you don't go and do a, you know, formal spiritual retreat, actually for many people lying on a beach, but for me, if I spend time on a beach, an uninhabited beach with very few other people, um, listen to the sound of the waves. And uh, uh, that for me is a spiritual retreat. And what is it for you? That, the question is, what is it for you? And so this balance between just enjoying, be, looking in a child's eyes. My godson, you know, I don't have children, but my godson has been having trouble sleeping. And, um, you know, and I, when I go, he falls asleep in my arms. It's the most beautiful thing. Um, so it's always that sort of balance of how much am I spending time being and how much am I spending time becoming? And you sometimes have to have a little bit of doing thrown in, pay the mortgage, pay your kids' university fees, whatever it happens to be. Any questions? Great, thanks for turning your camera on, Patricia. And uh, Maze, we like to have our cameras on in this group. We try to make it as close to um, a face-to-face -face experience as we can. If you look around, you'll see that people are touched. It's just notice the field, notice the group. So, you know, three things get brought to these sessions, your own individual hope, heart, attention, of course, what I'm saying and doing, and also, of course, the, what everybody else brings to the field. And that part is people often don't recognize that that's a really important part of the experience. There's something really powerful about groups working on their personal evolution together. Did I, were there any questions? Did I see one person unmute themselves and then remute again? Ulbrich. Yeah, um, how do you know how much is enough? How do you know how much is enough in in every... How long is a piece of string? Sorry? How long is a piece of string? Depends on its uh, utility. Like it, yeah, it's... and you decide um, what's enough. Um, and we have to be really careful. It's actually worth bringing this up because in terms of how will I know I've had a good life? You know, who, who decides what success is for you? You know, is it your grandparents? Is it your parents? Is it you? Because, you know, some countries, I'm not going to name any right now, but they've had so much suffering in the 20th century that, that you know, what was success for the grandparents is not the same as what success was for the parents and is not the same as what success is for the children. And actually each of us needs to, to say, thank you, mum, thank you, dad, thank you for your aspirations for my life. But what, what, is, what, is, what is success for me? My father wanted me to be a member of an English gentleman's club and be a banker. All, that's all well and good, you know, but it's not what I, it's not what I want. You know, I learned in my childhood that being rich didn't make you happy and that didn't, didn't bring love. So each of us has to work out what is my criteria for success? How will I know? By the way, th those criteria ch change. You know, you want to be top of your career and you suddenly think, actually, it's a load of competing egos. And I'm actually more, I'm more interested in being soulful. You know, things will change as life goes on. And there are different, you know, when you're, you're in your 30s and your you know 30s and 40s you're often very career focused in your 50s you're beginning to think about what what's it all about what do I want to do in my 60s and in your 60s you say hey how can I really have more being in the rest of my life you know these things change thank you Albrecht good question Paul uh, mine um, you've, you've probably gone beyond it now it was just a comment um not in relation to anything you've said but 
for a long time, um, I've had an aversion to the program The Apprentice, and I've regarded it as abysmally, woefully, uh, culturally, psychologically destructive. Um, but I think it's to do with the age range of the uh, participants. But, you know, it's, it's so ego-driven and it's about achieving at any cost and beating down anybody else who's a rival. And I think it's morally dismal. So, um, and, and it's so easy to be brought into that kind of, um, into that cultural competitiveness in one's jobs, in many, many, many jobs that met, met perhaps people here have experienced where, um, Thank you. We're target driven and so on. But anyway, enough of that. Thank you. Um, I haven't seen The Apprentice, so I can't really comment. But I know that people think that whatever his name is, who runs The Apprentice in the UK, you know, I think he's moderately successful in business, but he's not an example of a good businessman. And, no, and Donald Trump, you know, he wasn't even successful at all. Most of Donald Trump's money came from his father. You know, these are sort of media shows. And they're not really what business is like. The best businesses nowadays actually are learning to promote um, uh, not only intelligent, they've done that for a while, but emotionally intelligent people who are good leaders of people. Um, and that's sort of a, that is such a bad example of those programs of what business is about. And actually, um, I know one of the best sponsors of personal development are some of the big businesses in the world, you know, um, a company, you know, I won't even mention companies, but there are companies that spend a fortune on developing their staff and their managers and really are rigorous about it. So let's pray for more of that. Um, anything else before we do go into a meditation? Great. As soon as I say the word meditation, people run away, but that's, I see, if I went for the, for my, for a negative, um, sort of what's the word interpretation I'd say because they didn't want the meditation but I could give a positive one which says they want to empty their bladders before the meditation starts <laughs> um, so um, so for those of you who haven't done meditations with me before some people like to turn their cameras off but um, I like it if some at least some people and most people do keep their cameras on because then I get to um, um, I'm guided by you. Oh, Mize, by the way, thanks for turning your camera on. Really great to have you here. So it's great. Um, you know, it's it's helpful for me to interact with you. Otherwise, I'm just looking at a computer screen and then I just start, you know, I might, I don't know, you know. Um, you know, here's my, let me tell you my bad joke about the COVID jabs. It's like I keep talking to Bill Gates, but he doesn't seem to answer. I thought that I'd get to talk to Bill Gates. Um, but uh, anyway, so <laughs> bad joke. Um, so, um, so we're going to do a meditation. And the first step that I always propose is that we just notice our senses, just checking what you see, what you hear, what you feel. Just sort of settling down a bit, making yourself comfortable, just bringing yourself present. And, you know, so that's present in the body, present to the sounds, and I like to listen to the sounds outside the window because I can, for example, I can hear an airplane probably landing at Heathrow. And so therefore I am a space bigger than this physical body. Sound, I can be the field of sound. If I'm the field of sound, it's bigger than my body. So I've got the sensations of my body, the limits of my body, my skin, my muscles, my emotions. I've got the sounds outside the window. I've got, I can listen for sounds in the house. I can't hear any right now. 
or sounds in the room, you can hear my voice. Possibly you can hear the fan on your computer, depending on what computer you have. Can you hear sounds in your body of breathing or your heart? And listen to your inner voice from a distance, someone who's chatting to you in a bar or or at a conference. Listen with curiosity, be interested, be compassionate, but don't necessarily believe what it says. That voice is not you, it's just one voice one sound, one part of your experience. And let's start, well, we have started with being, being here in this moment. If you take a breath and you really pay attention to the detail of it, the detailed feeling of it, the hairs moving in your nose as you breathe in, the feeling of the air cooling your nostrils, down your throat, the raising of the muscles, of the, the, the raising of your rib cage as your muscles relax and your solar plexus pulls the air down and your ribs actually move apart. There's so much detail to pay attention to that we don't normally pay attention to, which is why one really helpful, interesting form of meditation is to just tend to the minutia of breathing and notice, be curious about how your experience changes every second, every millisecond perhaps. And I wonder when in your life you had really powerful experiences of being, of being just completely in the present moment, remembering what it looked like. Perhaps there were sounds that 
help to revivify the memory. And to use the sounds and the memory, the image, to help you have the feeling again. Perhaps if it's outdoors in no nature, perhaps there's the smell of the environment, such as the smell of the sea. Remember details of the experience to help yourself go deeper. And if you're the sort of person whose mind flits around, you can always allow other memories of being really present in the present moment to arise see, hear, and feel those, to feel it in your body. And you can add one memory to the other, or you can collect the feelings of different memories together to deepen your experience. And notice how in these moments of being, you experience every moment. Just be so curious about how attention jumps around paying a different paying attention to different parts of your experience such as different feelings in your body a different place on your skin air temperature on the skin or the warmth of a foot in a sock and your muscles And it's always interesting to notice muscles that you don't usually pay much attention to. Paying attention to the sounds that you don't normally listen to. Now, there's nothing wrong with thoughts. But it's like you need to have the front door open to let the thoughts in and the back door open to let the thoughts out. You just don't sit down for tea with thoughts. So the thoughts, they, they can be seductive. They get you into a long conversation and then you stop paying attention to the rest of your experience. Since thoughts are only one small part of your experience, you let them come, but you let them go because you want to pay attention to your body to your ears, 
to your eyes. The same with visual images in your mind's eye. Are you conscious of them? Some people are so involved in making so intimate with their visual images, they don't even know that they're making them. So just notice everything but awareness has behind what you see, behind what you hear, behind what you feel is consciousness or awareness itself. Can you sense and be curious about the awareness itself? This awareness is called primordial nature. And in this place of being, I wonder if you want to make a request to yourself or to, to make an intention, just a few words. You may or may not want to, but to allow yourself more opportunities for being or to allow yourself to deepen your practice of being, if that's something of interest to you. For me, the moments of being are refuges, are refuges from the busyness of the world that I can go to any time I remember. And now let's explore becoming a seed is in the ground. And in the winter, the seed stays very still. But as the, the world, as the earth warms up, as spring comes, the seed can feel the warmth of spring through the ground. And the seed knows where to go, perhaps with the help of gravity, the seed knows to grow up through the soil towards the surface. And then sprouting out in the spring through the surface of the ground and up towards the sun. And isn't it really great to know even if you don't know where the sun is, your inner, your deep nature knows in which direction to travel. Evolution, growth, blossoming is a natural process, both in the biological, psychological, and spiritual world. We're learning creatures. So isn't it great to know that it's, your, that it's your natural inclination to grow towards the sun? And so in spring, you bud. And then there's the process of blossoming into full potential. 
And then in autumn, of course, all the unnecessary things get dropped away in preparation for another season. So how will you know that you've had a great life? How will you know that your life has been really fulfilled? Of course there will be regrets. But what will you look like? How will you feel? What will your relationship with yourself be? How do you want to be with other people? In your healthy old age, when you fulfilled your potential? How are you making a difference in the world? In your healthy old age, it's probably the, the most pure time of being. Perhaps the difference you make in the world is through your being, the way you talk to someone or a child. The way you connect, perhaps. And this vision of how you will be when you fulfilled your potential in life is something that can grow and develop during the course of the hours and days and weeks that come. And it's really important to have this vision and to have a big vision, an exciting vision, not of what you do necessarily, but of who you are. And if you're someone who wants to do a lot, first imagine who you can be that would be capable of doing a lot, learning through success and through failure and through difficulty. And then perhaps later today in the evening or in the next few days, you may want to flesh it out a bit to imagine if that's where you want to get to in your healthy old age, what are the big decades? What are the big milestones? For me, it's 85 and then back from that 70. And three years between now and 70. What is it for you? Is it 60? Is it 40? Is it, is it 30? Somehow taking the big dream of your healthy old age and just bringing it back into manageable amounts of time. In business, they have 10-year plans, three-year plans, and one-year plans. And so you can just dream about this during the course of this next week, or later tonight, and perhaps whenever you need to, dreaming in your waking dreams and in your sleeping dreams. And you bring it right back so that you know what it is that you need to do this year. This and this quarter. And this week. Take it right back so that my actions tomorrow are connected with 
where I want to be in my healthy old age. And a part of this, we just need to maintain the balance between becoming and being. Time every day to be, time every week to be, to just enjoy life for the sake of it, is a part, I would say, of who you want to be in your healthy old age, someone who can just enjoy the weather, whatever the weather is whether it's rain, whether it's sun, whether it's wind, whether it's hot, whether it's cold, someone who can just enjoy being alive. So there's becoming and being, and sometimes we lean one way and sometimes we lean the other way. But only you will know what is inspirational and exciting and motivating for you and makes your heart sing and makes your life feel like a wonderful adventure. And when you're ready, Gradually reorientate yourself to the group. And just stay deeply connected with yourself, but turn your cameras on. And we're going to go into groups of three and some groups of four. In the groups of three, it'll be seven minutes per person. One person talks about their own experience of how they will know They've had a great life and any milestones they have, any vision of how you might get there. And you've only got, you've got seven minutes per person in the groups of three. In the group of four, it'll be five minutes per person. I will do the timing for the group of four. So those in groups of three will need to do their own timing of seven minutes per person. One person talks for the whole seven minutes and the other two people listen. And all you can say is, tell me more. Yes, I hear you. You can't give advice. You can't make suggestions. You can't interrupt. You can't coach. You're just being really present with your heart, listening and saying yes to the soul of the person. So, the rooms are open now. Join your breakout rooms. Welcome back. Still 30 seconds for, the, for some people to come back so we can chat amongst ourselves. Um, okay, good to see you all. And May, is this, is this your first um, class you've come to? Yes, actually. <laughs> Hey, did I, how do I, did, um, did I pronounce your name right? Mace, yeah, that's right. You're the first one pronouncing it right. <laughs> oh, that's, that was just luck, I have to say. Thank you. Um, and do you, how do you know me, through um, Creative Mind or something like that? Yeah, actually, my friend, she posted uh, on her uh, Facebook account that she's going to join uh, this session. Yeah. So I, yeah, I searched uh, the session, then I joined it and I registered and I joined. What's her name? Her name is Jihan. Jihan, I know her, Jihan, from yeah. Jordan, exactly. Yeah, yeah, we're great. friends here in Jordan, yeah. <laughs> great, she's a great, I really, she's a great woman, I like her she a lot. Is. Yeah, she is. Good, so um, I think everybody is back. Great to have you here, Mice. Um, and, um, yeah, um, I'm just feeling, so sometimes I stop and I pause. And it's not because my blow brain is mushy, which it is, I have to say, but because sometimes I just want to feel into my body. So that's the being part. So like what is the feeling that's here right now, what's needed right now in this moment? And uh, yeah, so it's great to see all of your faces. Um, I want to apologize to Patricia. I put you into one group 
then someone didn't go into another group. And so then I did this magical thing of Zooming you from one group to another. So please, everybody know in the future, if you're in a nice group of four and suddenly you go into some sort of inter down an interstellar wormhole and end up in another planetary space, that's because of the amazing powers that get given to me by virtue of running a Zoom room. So it's great. So um, sharing questions, comments, how, how was this meditation and exercise for you? Who wants to share? Who hasn't shared so far? Could be positive, could be difficulty. Or a question. Katie, you have to unmute. It was good and I didn't go to sleep. Fantastic. Well, I don't know if it's fantastic. <laughs> you go to sleep, you know, uh, meditations are just as good if you go to sleep. It's just the, con oh. the conscious mind doesn't like it because they don't remember what happened. But <laughs> anything else, uh, Katie, other than just not going to um, sleep? Yeah, I quite like the sort of exploring the life purpose through the meditation and this idea that you can sort of spend time daydreaming about it and planning and but no pressure so sort of it evolves and meditation I think helps helps lots of things evolve in a gentle way it, it shouldn't be too uh, you know having a life calling um mm. shouldn't be too conscious you know the, no. you know there's this book called the master and the emissary and um McGilchrist by McGilchrist and he basically says that the master is the right brain that was the that's the one that experiences the world the emissary is the is the PR person who communicates with the world, who maps things, who turns things into logic, but the emissary um, has tried to has, has staged a revolution and has tried to take over the you know to take over the power of the master, and the <laughs> left brain has got itself into this dominant position, but soulful things don't get worked out with the left brain. So, you know, the left brain points you in a certain direction. The logical brain can point you in a direction and you can set outcomes. But it's a bit like, the, you know, the rider and the horse. The rider is saying, oh, get me to that gate at the corner of the field. But you let the horse work out how to get there. And so with these sorts of things, a little bit of thinking is fine, but daydreaming is better. And there's natural daydreaming. Uh, there's something called the Altradian rhythm. I think it's the Altradian rhythm, which is, I think, every um, is it hour and a half, something like that. There are moments every hour and a half we have a need to sit back, put our hands behind our head or stare out of the window or get a cup of tea or fiddle around, look at Facebook or do some activity. The brain naturally takes us into meditative states. Or, you know, so that's the easiest way. You just say, well, I, I, I need time to daydream. Let yourself daydream. I sit in the bath in the morning and daydream. And my logical brain says, for God's sake, get out of the bath, get to work, you've got a job to do. My, my soul says, this is the most perfect place. And let me just keep dreaming away. So find, find times to dream away about it. Um, yeah, that's great. Good, good, good point. Katie. Thank you. Great. Who, anyone else? Who wants to go next? Who wants to? Go on, Gianrico. Oh, just a question. Is it, uh, someone says that it's the last uh, meeting today? Only the last meeting in this series, in this particular oh. series. Um, next week, I'm going to do something on, um, uh, um, about your, for the next six weeks, I'm going to do something on, you know, what have you got from your ancestors? So we're going to explore the transgenerational stuff. What did you get? You know, so there's all the blessings from your ancestors and there's all the trauma from your ancestors. And we know from trauma that it's transgenerational. You know, you, you, you will carry the trauma of at least three generations. And, um, and but we want, so we want to bring healing to the trauma, awareness and healing to the trauma, but we also want to maximize, optimize the blessings from the previous generation. So we're gonna spend six sessions on that. And um, for those of you who, um, you know, if you're an orphan, you know, if you don't know who your parents were, you know, we'll cover that because you don't need, you're still affected by it, even if you haven't got a cognitive 
if you don't know cognitively, you still carry it. And also, um, if, if like me, there are some branches of my family that I know nothing about, I'm still experiencing it. And also, of course, there'll be things that happen in you know, the womb, experiences you have before you were verbal that you won't have words, you won't, it would be hard for you to put words and memories to. So we'll cover all of that. But a part of it is, is just, what the, you know, the positive part is to really get the blessings, the gifts of your ancestors. And, and then, you know, the, 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 the healing part is that, you know, your ancestors may have been traumatized. You know, your parents and your grandparents may have been traumatized and you will carry that with you whether or not the trauma is still there present today, you carry that in your body. Um, and so therefore healing needs to be brought to that. And then we'll look at collective trauma as well. So we're gonna have really an exciting time. Um, and um, it's very, one of the reasons why this is important is that if you've done the normal sort of psychological work, I'll come back to today's session in a moment, but that was too good an opportunity to miss. Um, you know, uh, if you, if you've done a lot of psychological work that's focused on your own personal history, a lot of psychotherapy, psychological work, personal development work is about your own life history. And if you've done a lot of work on your own life history and you still haven't got the changes you want, maybe it's because it isn't about your life. You're carrying something from before your life from, you know, and so that will be, and it, it'll be genetic. It'll be actually, you know, in your genes. And it could also be just in the culture of your family and your community that things were communicated to you. You know, my mother was a soldier in the Second World War. She acted like a soldier and she had post-traumatic stress syndrome. Just the way she brought us up had, you know, she carried it through that way. But also she, she was from a line of soldiers. So there's a whole lineage of soldiers. That are there. So anyway, that's what we'll be doing next week. Basically, <laughs> Very interesting. Thank you. Could almost be certain that, that every week there'll be something on a Wednesday. I try to do something every Wednesday. In the summer, I took a break last summer. Um, but, uh, um, and Celine Vega, who some of you will know, will be running one of the sessions in the series um, when I'm away. So, anyway, that was great. Any questions? Thank you, Gianrico. Any more comments or questions about what we've just been doing? Thank you very much. <laughs> great. Julian, I love the, the thing where you said, and correct me if it's uh, incorrect, the, uh, uh, thoughts leave, the thoughts come in an open door, but they leave, leave the back door open so they can go out. That's brilliant. Where'd you get that? <laughs> I got it from a Buddhist master. I can't think where I got it from. Um, you know, there's this sort of, when you start meditating, you sort of like feel like you've got to stop the thoughts. And actually not following thoughts, not addictively, you know, not just getting... You know, I'm sitting here and then I think of something and then I think of the next thing and then I'm lost in the thought. And I've lost 10 minutes of my meditation in thinking because I followed the thought. Um, thoughts naturally arise. That's just the nature of being human. It's, it's the obsessive following of the thought that, that is the problem. Um, and, um, you know, if obviously if you're planning something, you need to think it through. You know, there are times when thinking things through is the is. But we think things through all the time, don't we? And so it's actually learning to um, to hear um, to, to hear notice the thought and say hi to, hi to the thought and then to let it go. And in fact, if you do a lot of meditation, as you can catch the thought as it's rising, you know how early in the development of the thought can you catch it? Because the earlier you catch it, the less um, addictive it will be, the less hypnotic it will be. Um, Paul, um, it's fine if you've got a question. You very often you have. A, um... I haven't. It's a it's a it's a reflection on my experience in the meditation. Okay, I great. Wasn't, I wasn't lulled to a, a kind of unawareness. What I did find is that it, it aided a, a reflection and perspective on things and concerns um, of, of my experience, and it was very very useful and profitable because I wasn't dwelling and analyzing, but just noting and acquiring a kind of wisdom, a wise perspective on things. And I think you facilitated that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. I mean, just generally, that is the purpose of these guided meditations. Um, it's, 
it's allowing the unconscious, it's allowing the poetic brain, it's allowing the, the right brain space to, for things to emerge, for, for things that are not thought through intellectually to emerge. It's, it's the body-mind connection, you know, it's, the, um, it's giving space for the body, for the emotions. You know, if soul is body, emotion, mind and spirit, we need to pay more attention to the body, emotion and spirit and less to mind. I mean, that's basically the purpose. Um, now who, someone, oh, Elizabeth. You need to unmute, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, in that, just to follow on that is like, I really experience the space around when you mentioned, uh, you know, if you have like, a, I don't even know how you called it a fleeting or like, you know, a lot of images come in. And even so there are different ages, the way how you presented it was more linear, but you, uh, you opened the space that, you know, the six year old or 10 year old can come in at the same time. I imagine the 85 year old and they can actually be in relationship in that. So it was, really beautiful to experience the space and the permission that the child is present with the elder and the working and and and, and. so thank, thank you, you. I, I really like that feel like yeah i did and i did mention you know that the, the adult can be there with the child and but actually wouldn't that be a great meditation sometime we can have a like a a round table meeting with the six-year-old, the 16-year-old, the 26-year-old, the 36-year-old, all the way to the you know, 106-year-old. Wouldn't it be great to get them all around the table together or the, in the play, in, you know, in the garden together? So uh, it, it felt that way. And, you know, that you could be in the mountain and in the rocking chair at the same time. Yeah. yeah. yeah beautiful. Isn't it? Thank you for that. That sort of sharing from Elizabeth. Well, some people here will go away and they'll have a meeting between their 86-year-old and their six-year-old, you know, which would be, that's a great relationship, isn't it? Introduce, you know, the, all those different ages to each other. Um, you know, my, my, my six-year-old knows how to play, you know. Um, you know, there's a sort of 50-year-old in me that is a bit serious and focused on work. You know, so those two can work really well together. So great to do that. So um, I'm going to we're going to stop shortly because um, I'm running a session from 6 p.m. to 6:45 p.m. on the Life Talent Program Tools for Personal Transformation Level One, which um, starts next Tuesday and runs for nine weeks, and uh, it's the entry workshop for life talent level two and level three there's going to be a level three in 2023 so level one is the key tools for personal transformation level two is really making them a part of your everyday life and then level three which is a separate program in 2023 is having done all this inner work um then um, 20, um life talent level three will focus on giving your gift to the world what is your um, strategic plan, your business plan, your marketing plan to express your life calling clearly out into the world, either through your brand as an individual working in an organization, your individual brand, you know, your leadership brand, or as a small business, expressing yourself really clearly into the world and making your marketing world. That's level three, which I'm excited about. But level one is just the key tools for personal transformation. So we'll stop in a second. And um, um, and those of you who I will give the link to uh, those of you who want to come to that. Um, it's a different link, um, 45 minute session. And what I'm actually going to do is actually um, give you that link right now into the chat for those of you who might be interested in coming. And uh, I've got to turn chat on again which I turned off because it distracts me during the course 
of meditation. One question, is it every year? You, you start every year, the level one? Because this year is a little difficult for me. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, no, twice a year, in the January and in November. Um, okay, thank and, you. Yeah. And um, just to um, end today, um, I'd just like to thank you for being here as a part of this series. It's been really great to be with you. I'd love to hear a word from everybody about how um, you're feeling right now. And um, so if you unmute yourself and uh, just say a word or a phrase about how you're feeling right now. Wonder. Mm -hmm. Happy. Cool. cool. Relaxed. Curious. Moving. Dreamy. Oh, repeat, those two repeat yourselves. Oh, dreamy. dreamy. Curious. Connected. Supported. Thoughtful. Free. Free. Connected. Connected. Anyone not spoken? Powerful. Right. Lovely to see you. I look forward to next week. Ancestors from next week for six weeks. Lots of love. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Julian. Thank you. Bye. 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 B